Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today we are joined by the very acclaimed author, Mr. Joel Selvin. Joel, welcome to the podcast. Good to be here, Bart. Yes. So I am super excited. You've been on my calendar for a year. I believe I emailed you like a year ago because someone recommended, you know, hey, there's a Jim Gordon book coming out. And I found you and then you said, talk to me in a year. <laughs> so you've been <laughs> the farthest out calendar invite kind of thing on my uh, on my phone calendar for a while. Today, we're talking about Drums and Demons, The Tragic Journey of Jim Gordon, which is a very sad story. It's it's famous to many, many drummers, but I've, I've been asking around to folks who aren't drummers and they go, who's Jim Gordon? So it's interesting how, you know, uh, it's it's a wild story that I think it, it, we can help get it out there even more. That's great. Your book is out today, the day that this is, podcast is coming out, uh, February 27th. It's available to purchase. The story is incredible drummer, prolific career. Fast forward, tragic ending where he ended up uh, murdering his mother uh, in, a, in a schizophrenic kind of frenzy. I just want to let people know that's what we're getting at so you don't get to the end and go, whoa. So backing up, Joel, how did his career start? Well, the first thing I want to tell you, Bart, is that <clears throat> schizophrenia is unbelievably common. It occurs mm -hmm. in one in 100 in the general population. By comparison, multiple sclerosis is one in 10,000. So wow. all those people you see out on the streets, sleeping under freeways, they're hearing voices. They're schizophrenics. And it's a tragedy of extraordinary dimensions. They do not live in the same reality that you and I do. And through no fault of their own, through chemicals in their brain, they are out of step with what you and I call normal life. Jeez. Jim. Yes had a golden life. Uh, he was raised in San Fernando Valley in the 50s and, and uh, found drums early in life and fell all the way down that rabbit hole. By the time he was in high school, he was being trained at UCLA. He played in various uh, symphony orchestras and marching bands. And by the time he completed high school, uh, well, the next day, he went on the road with the Everly Brothers. So 17 years old, he's starting at the top. He's gra gravitated to session work, and in Los Angeles in the early 60s, session work was something that was just exploding. And yeah. Jim had this extraordinary ability, this natural, this intuitive uh, grasp of dividing time uh, that everybody who heard him play was just shocked and amazed. Uh, he rewrote the Book of Drums. Uh, the, the big session drummers in Los Angeles at the time were Earl Palmer and Hal Blaine. And they just stepped aside, and Jim went in shoulder to shoulder. Jim's playing on Good Vibrations by the Beach Boys. He's playing on Beat Goes On by Sonny and Cher. He's playing on Nancy Sinatra records, uh, Glenn Campbell records. There's a brilliant drum part on Wichita Linemen. And he attained his, uh, the, the, the height of success in session work, six days a week, three sessions a day, $100,000, $200,000 a year. He's 20 years oh old. Gosh. Wow. And after five years of that, he grew tired of rooms with no windows. Plus, in 1969, the scene had shifted from hit records to the stage. 1969, Led Zeppelin was touring that fall. They did a two-and-a-half-hour show with a half-hour drum solo. Uh, who were taking Tommy around the country. The Rolling Stones were back on the boards. Yep. And that's when Jim got into the Delaney and Bonnie band. Uh, went from that to Joe Cocker and Mad Dogs and Englishmen, and straight from that to London, where he was a founding member of Derek and the Dominoes. And, of course, he's mm. the half-author of Layla, which is the you know single classic rock yeah. anthem of all time. He left yeah. London uh, a, after a couple years there. I mean, Derek and the Dominoes, their first job was was playing on the George Harrison solo sessions, which at that point was the absolute height of the rock culture. And he's in there doing it's, the first solo sessions for yeah. um, former Beatles. And, and, and Ringo started out doing those sessions, but he had to go to Nashville for a couple weeks. When he came back, Jim was behind the kit, and they gave him a tambourine. Okay? And Ringo didn't mind. <laughs> back in Los Angeles, he went back to the session work right away. 
He's doing hit records right off. Helen Reddy, I Am Woman, uh, Gordon Lightfoot, Sundown, Ricky Don't Lose That Number, Steely Dan, his masterpiece, uh, You're So Vain, Carly Simon. And he worked as much as you could work. Uh, about hmm. 1975, uh, he started really being interfered with by the mental illness. By 1978, he was done. He comes to an really? end, a sudden end. He goes to Las Vegas. He's going to play a, a two-week engagement with Paul Anka. He sets up for the rehearsal. He strikes his drum once. And the voices in his head tell him he's going to be dead if he strikes it a second time. He looks up at the musical director and says, I have psychological problems. I can't play this gig. Wow. And he went home, and he really didn't play uh, 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 anymore. You know, a little bit here, this band, a little bit there, that band. No more big sessions. No more double-scale dates. No, You know, but it was really hard for him just to get out of his house. Was he... Earlier on, was this documented at all that he was having these kind of issues? I guess I don't know much about schizophrenia, if you're born with it or if it kind of creeps up. Neither do the doctors, Bart. They don't know what causes yeah. it. They don't know why it goes into remission when it does. They, they, they don't understand much about it at all. Yeah. Uh, and also, in, in Jim's case, the psychiatrist he saw, and he saw many, he checked into uh, uh, psychiatric hospitals many times, like 15 times in four years. They didn't understand the dimensions of his illness because he was so successful. He was so high functioning. They, d- they just assumed that he was depressive or maybe there was yeah. a mood disorder, but they didn't see. And then we also got to cut them some slack because Jim was lying to them. He wasn't telling them about the voices uh, and the so-called command hallucinations. So what command hallucinations are is the voices tell you to do something. And if you don't do it, they give you the mother of all headaches. The psychiatrists call it the electric hat band. Jim called it white hot cruelty pain. It's a sort of headache that would make you crawl along the floor and wet your pants. Oh, my God. So if the, if the voices don't want you to eat, you put your fork down. And you leave the restaurant. Wow. If the voices don't want you to play drums, you don't play drums. And the voices hated drums and hated uh, uh, him uh, eating. And uh, now, you know, I'm, I'm talking about this like they're uh, uh, some entity outside of Jim's mind, but they aren't. Yeah. And that frustrated Jim, too, that he felt he was an intelligent person, a capable person, and he couldn't manage this. He couldn't surmount it. It was something that was he was ashamed of. So he didn't reveal yeah. himself to people. There would be these uh, unexplained episodes, little explosions or, or, or violent episode outbreaks even. But they weren't clear what they were about to even Jim. But nowadays he would be given medicine to probably. They gave him medicine then. They gave him yeah. primitive uh, uh, antipsychotic medicine, heavy duty tranquilizers. The only thing that worked for Jim was illegal drugs. Alcohol worked and cocaine worked. Co- cocaine, I, I'm talking to psychiatrists. Why would cocaine work on somebody whose head's filled with voices? Oh, it regulates the dopamine levels. Okay. Uh-huh. And so cranks alcohol up the had a, a, and, a, a, a very yeah. uh, deafening effect. It deafened the voices. Uh, gotcha. So those, uh, he, and, and, and he had this enormous capacity to consume any kind of medicine. Well, one of his psychiatrists told me that he had left a prescription at the hospital for Jim. He wanted him to take 45 milligrams of Haldol, which is just a really strong antipsychotic. In three doses a day, 15, 15, and 15. And he shows up a couple of days later, looks at the chart, and they've been giving him three doses of 45 a day, 45, wow. 45, 45. The shrink heads up the, to see Jim, figuring this guy's going to be a zombie. <laughs> he didn't experience even any therapeutic effects. Okay, so he's wired a little bit differently. but Well, that's why know, he maybe- drums like he does. You read my mind. I was going to say maybe that's what makes him so special. The other way, which the electrochemical I mean, uh, setup yeah. in his brain obviously gifted him with this incredible intuitive ability to divide time. Yeah, you know, I've heard other drummers 
uh, uh, trying to describe the Jim Gordon style to me. You know, you retard the second beat and then it puts a roll in the measure and, yeah. you know, oh, you can do it, right? No, you can't. Yeah. Do, do you have to have such finely tuned intuition in order to play beyond notation like that? Right? Yeah, it's this, we're not style talking demi, and- demi semi quavers. We're talking beyond that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Which, all right, we're, we're like, I mean, we just went, that was an, an unbelievable way to summarize it. But I just want to kind of, people got this from what you said, but the amount of sessions and songs, and you can't li- be in the car listening to the radio for more than 10 minutes if you have classic rock or, you know, whatever, a, a, a rock station on without hearing a Jim Gordon song. I mean, he is a part of music history more than people pro- very fairly give credit to, but he was a protege of Hal Blaine as, as, as what I've read. I mean, he was, so his, he was in the wrecking crew, correct? Well, first of all, that's a term I, 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 I kind of deplore. Uh, it comes, it comes up in the eighties, how, how Blaine sort of popularized it. The guy's, in the recording sessions that worked those sessions back in Los Angeles in the 60s, they didn't know they were the wrecking crew. I know. And then Carol K, K oh, or whatever. About it. But so was Steve Douglas, yeah. who was a very close friend of mine. Steve thought it was really um, uh, trivializing. And, okay. and who's the wrecking crew? 50, 60 people. Yeah. But what you're saying was true, that, that Hal Blaine and Earl Palmer were the first called drummers. Jim shows up on the scene in 1964 and he vaults right into them along their, you know, first call. Yeah. Uh, Protege, yeah, Hal tossed him all the work. Hal introduced him to the Beach Boys. Uh, Hal awesome. and Jim share the composite master track to Good Vibrations, although that's all Jim on Heroes and Villains. Mm. And you know about God Only Knows, right? Uh, Lunch juice bottles. Oh, really? Yeah. He's fooling around capacity? with orange juice bottles on uh, the session. Somebody else has got the trap set. He's doing additional percussion. And Brian catches on to it and goes, hey, yeah. So he takes a razor blade and he cuts off the bottom of four orange juice bottles and he pitches them so they're four different notes. And he goes right along the drum part going clop, 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 clop. <laughs> Next time you hear God only knows, you're going to hear those orange yeah, juice Yeah, now I, I will... I will have to hear it. And you sent oh, me some right, great. They're right in the mix. They're part of the whole thing. That's awesome. And you sent me some great photos of it looks like Brian Wilson kind of shirtless in the studio and then Jim Gordon wearing a fire hat. That's the fire sessions from the Smile album. Yeah, it looks like he fit right in and and could kind of hang because he was younger than those other guys. So he was kind of getting into that rock generation a little bit more than maybe Earl Palmer and Hal Blaine, who were a little bit earlier. So he was a young guy, but he was, Jim was he rock was, and roll. You know, that, I roll. go into that yeah. in the book about how all these other drummers were under the influence of Gene Krupa. And, yeah, and the, the, that, that was their world was Gene Krupa. And, and, and Jim, he was rock and roll baby. He, he was 11 years old when, uh, when Heartbreak Hotel hit the radio. So yeah. that, that's an, he's that other side of that generation. And that's what yeah. he brought to the Los Angeles recording sessions was he brought this rock and roll sensibility. The Everly Brothers loved Jim. Yeah, which that's huge. I mean, that is an enormous first band to get into. But all right, so he's playing on all these huge songs. He's getting the money. Did, what was his lifestyle like? I mean, did he, did he have a big house? Did he have fast cars? Or was he just work all the time? He you married know, was his he, high was school he, sweetheart who was a yeah. dancer on Dick Clark's Where the Action Is. Hmm. Gorgeous blonde gal. They loved cars. They bought cars like crazy. Uh, they had a, a, a beautiful Spanish style two bedroom house in the valley, not far from where his parents lived. And yeah, you, when you work uh, uh, three sessions a day, six days a week, you, know, you don't have too much time for a lifestyle. And his sure. wife was on a, a, a TV show five days a week. So they, they were a busy young show business couple. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe that working, 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 not taking a break, obviously might have exacerbated the, uh, you know, not letting his brain calm down. But Here's this sounds what I like think it about was that part. Is yeah. I think the only place in the world where Jim was safe was with drumsticks in his hand, and I think yeah. that the rhythmic entrainment and the report of the drum, because as you know, when you hit a drum. You feel it in every cell in your body. It's not oh, like yeah. playing trumpet. Uh, I believe those two things 
and the power of the almighty groove just lifted him up above the voices. And he didn't hear the voices and he didn't have the, the, the he didn't have his disease and he was free. And that's mm. why the drumming was the sanctuary to him. Everybody else is just a drummer. Good Jim drums were life. Wow. That's very powerful. I mean, truly for it to be freeing him from quote unquote kind of demons in his head. That is wild. All right. So he burns out. Let's get back on that timeline there of kind of leading up to what happened. So how old was he when he stopped? Like when he was like, I'm not doing this anymore. I can't play the sessions anymore. If you had to put a rough age 45 and, 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 uh, stopped in 78. So what's that? That's 33. Man. I'm 33. That's incredible to have. Well, he had a 15 year career. That's it. 15 years. Yeah. And, you, you know, I played on a hundred great records. Yeah. Iconic. And all those guys are, I mean, Eric Clapton, I mean, the beat, you know, George Harrison's passed away, but, but really looking at your list on this nice sheet you sent me though, like John Lennon, George Harrison, Eric Clapton, Tom Petty, Frank Zappa, Steely Dan, Ringo Starr, Harry Nielsen, Joe Cocker, and many more. I mean, the list is it's I, I don't want to say it's the right place at the right time, but he pretty much was the guy on every iconic playing with every iconic rock star that we know today. So here's the thing, Bart, is that his job in the studio was to make hit records, right? Yeah. And that was a science that they pursued. So that after a while, after, you know, a couple thousand sessions, they're no longer chasing hit records. They're making hit records. And when <laughs> Jim so goes true. into the studio, he's a part of that hit making machine. And I could give yeah. you an example of example of, of, of pieces where his drum part sealed the deal. I mean, you're so yeah. vain. He was the third drummer to cut that track. Midnight at the Oasis. Who would have thought of that samba groove for that record? Jim did. Um, yeah. um, one of my favorites of his is My Maria by B.W. Stevenson. Uh, he just embeds the drum part so far into the f composition, into the fabric of the composition. You can't imagine somebody else playing it. And if somebody else had, had tackled it who was just like a, you know, a backbeat timekeeper kind of guy, it would have been just an ordinary uh, piece. I'm not sure it would have been a top 10 hit. So yeah. that's the surgical skill that, that guy developed. And when he got out into the rock band world, where you're no longer playing under a microscope, but you're playing to the grandstands, he opened up his style. And you can hear him on live albums by Traffic, Delaney and Bonnie, Joe Cocker, and Derek and the Dominoes. And he's ferocious. Good. I mean, that's great that he, uh, I feel like with the way you describe it of getting out of the walls of the studio and getting on the stage, that had to be fun. I mean, was he living the rock and roll lifestyle on, on the road? I mean, was he partying pretty hard and kind of, uh, uh, I, I mean, was he living the life back then? So he was kind of a days? square guy that, that grew up in very conservative. Uh, and as the whole drug culture started to leak into it, he, he sampled it. But I think it was the Mad Dogs and Englishman tour where the, you know, he, he dived in drinking, psychedelics, everything. And that's also where he had his first real psych, uh, psychotic break when he mm. uh, punched out his girlfriend, Rita Coolidge. So, wow, not good. Uh, clearly, it, but it's hard to be in your own mind. I'm sure that must have been tough to just not be un really understand. He, he did understand, though. He did try and get himself checked out and just it not be able a, to. It took him a solve. long time to understand that the voices were something that he made up. Long, long time. Uh, that was, yeah, you can't even that, imagine that. That was that. when he was in residential treatment at UCLA when he finally told this, the, his psychiatrist that he realized that, th that he was generating the voices. Not that that made much difference, you understand. Yeah, they're still there. And they're still getting the headaches. Jeez, Louise. Yeah, that's terrible. So, all right, the, but we have about 10 years from ish from this point to when the tragedy kind of happened. So what, what happened in that period there when he was done playing, off the road? I remember reading it in your book where it's, you know, he's playing in kind of bar bands, and it's how your book starts. And it's not really very pretty to see that where what the guy came from. So how did that go? That that decade? Yeah, he was playing Blue Mondays out in Santa Monica at some Irish bar for about 40 people. Uh, oh, my God. Three sets a night, 50 bucks. 
The right. other guys in the band were all great musicians, but they hadn't had any success. They would go on eventually as a success. The bass player would go on to Chris Isaac's band and Pete Anderson, the guitar player, would produce Dwight Yoakam's records. But at that point, they were just, you know, scuffling uh, uh, and and they couldn't believe that Jim Gordon stumbled into their club one night and was looking for a band to join. Uh, he'd been in a couple of bands uh, and it, it, it was the thing in the MTV world, you know, bands. So he thought yeah. that might be a way back into music. It really didn't work out. One of the schizophrenics have an impossible time with human relations impossible so being yeah. in a band just strained all that part of his life of of having to keep that mask on that genial compliant collaborative mask while inside his interior life is roiling and turbulent so uh, and you mean band, meaning like instead of being a session player, right. I'm hired a for a tour. Of five it would be people or so who played together every night. Right, we're the band. Right. Yes, understood. There were a couple yeah, of oh different groups he yeah. put together, or he didn't, he didn't put them together. Other people put them together and included him, who were session musicians who would like not getting the kind of work they were before the MTV thought maybe like directing themselves in this way. Hmm. But they well, never makes sense. You know, they but... never got past the garage band style. The Monday nights at the Santa Monica uh, Irish bar were like about as public as he got. Yeah, I imagine there wasn't much motivation or if you're having that much difficulty holding it together with four guys in a room because of what's going on inside of you. It's hard to kind of push and drive and have the, you know, and and really try to make it happen. So so he does that for a while and then take us through the the event, you know, if you want to talk about that. Well, chief among the voices in his head was the voice of his mother. And his mother was a, um, a nurse. Uh, I, there, 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 there was nothing wrong with Osa. Uh, maybe she was a little controlling, but you know she had a difficult uh, uh, child to deal with—a a adult child and, and uh, a grandchild that she was very close to. Uh, but she didn't really exist as a real person in Jim's head. Like Jim would go for dinner at his mother's house and she would wonder out loud why he didn't want to eat his dinner inside jim's head her voice was telling him don't eat that don't eat that it'll make you sick wow and she didn't understand this and jim thought that oh that was just her little game t trying to get him to eat he he knows she doesn't want him to eat right so and 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 osa also, uh, husband went into uh, Jim's dad went into uh, Alcoholics Anonymous in 1958. So they were extremely well versed in what the recovery community had to offer at, in the mid 70s. And hmm. Osa was convinced that Jim's problems were drugs and alcohol. She didn't understand that there was underlying mental issues. And, and in fact, the recovery community in 1975 had very little understanding of what we now know as dual diagnosis, where you're addicted and you have organic mental illness. And those things braid together in a very complex and confusing way. Sure. They know more about dealing with this now than they did in 75, but it's still very complicated. In 75, they didn't even have the phrase. So yeah. doctors yeah. were very confused about what the role drugs and alcohol played in his condition. And a none of them, and there were many, many, many doctors, and none of them guessed schizophrenia. He had to kill his mother for that diagnosis. And the whole thing uh, 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 built to an extraordinary, horrible climax. It started with the gold records. He had a room in which he hung all his gold records, and they were very important to him. That was all that was left of his career. And the voices wanted him to throw them away. And they tortured him. So he finally took the records down off the wall, took them out to the dumpster, went back to his condo, and guzzled vodka until he was drunk enough that the voices had died down. Then he went and got his gold records and hung them back up. Sometimes he would do this four or five times a night. 
Okay, this went on for weeks. And then the voices wanted the drums. Now that he didn't want to do at all. Yeah. So the headaches were unbelievable. Wow. And finally he had to give in there too. So every night he would go out and stack the gold records by the condo, uh, trash uh, the, the dumpster, go get his drums out of the garage and stack them by the dumpster and then go back and drink himself to just before he was unconscious and then put everything back. That went on until the night before he killed his mother. Man, torture. You wonder, and there's no answer to this, but you wonder why the voices in his head would be so, I mean, they're just, would make you want to be so like self, like, like just destroy everything that you love. I guess that's, there's no, I, don't, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of psychological reasons to that, but what misery that he had to go through. What well, the voices, uh, uh, the, 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 ch- check this out, Bart, the voices coming from his head. So they know everything he's ever done. They know yeah. every thought he's ever had. They know all his weak spots and they go right there. Uh, you couldn't have a, a worse enemy than yourself. Yeah, true. So true. And that's exactly what was going on with Jim was these voices were burrowing in to the to all his fears, all his his anxieties, his deepest feelings. Before we get to the next day or the next night with his mom, did he end up fully destroying his, you know, beloved gold records and drums or did those remain The out, night before you know, he killed his mother, he brought them back in. And he hung them up, only this time they weren't quite hanging right. They weren't so neat. They weren't. And he looked at them hanging on the wall in slight disarray, and he was overcome with a great sense of despair. So he was very, very far down some emotional uh, alleyway at that point. And when the thought started to occur to him, through voices in his head that he could kill his mother, it had never occurred to him before. Suicide had. There had been several suicide attempts. But this, that was a new thought. Now, he was concerned that his mother would feel the pain, so he got a hammer. He thought if he hit her with the hammer, he would knock her unconscious, and then he could stab her, and she wouldn't feel it. Uh, it was a brutal, brutal attack, and he smashed her with a hammer a number of times, and he stabbed her a number of times right through the aorta. She was killed instantly, and the last stab wound stuck in the floor. Jeez. Was he aware of what he did in did it kind of snap out of it for a second? I'm sure he was aware of what he did, but you know what I mean? Did it, the weight of it hit him? So he was, was he... in a, a, a fugue state, but he was very well aware of what he was doing in the sense of consciously sure. killing his mother. This was be very crucial in his trial because <clears throat> the year before, they had changed the law surrounding insanity defenses in California. And pretty much in order to qualify for an insanity defense, you had to not know what you were doing when you did it. And since the cops showed up at Jim's apartment, and the first thing he said to him was, I killed my mother, he knew what he was doing. Yeah. So they didn't really qualify for the insanity defense. However, the judge, and there was no jury, was understood that this man was insane. I mean, the the prosecution witnesses said he was insane yeah. uh, and didn't have the facility for premeditation. So Jim was convicted of second-degree murder. He was sentenced to 17 years. He served 38 and died in jail. Um, every time parole came up, Jim would do something to undermine his parole hearing. Yeah. He clearly... Didn't want out of jail. He wanted to stay in. Why no jury? I know there's re- my wife's an attorney, and it, but she's with the city here, and I I know there's reasons why they don't do juries for certain things. 
Why no jury for him? I think that was a very wise defense decision. Uh, uh, the horrifying nature of the crime was just so uh, extreme. Yeah, You kill your mother and everybody that you know looks the other way. Uh, yeah. Nobody visited Jim in jail. One person showed up at the trial. That would be Jay Osmond, the drummer of the Osmond Brothers. Uh, he was just instantly forgotten. And as far as his career goes and his contribution to the music, that's totally buried. Nobody thinks about it or talks about it or anything. There's some Rolling Stone list of the best 500 rock drummers. I haven't seen it myself, but somebody that did an interview with me checked it out. And they said they couldn't yeah. find him. You're right. I mean, I don't have that memorized, but I've seen that. And really, his name is uh, kind of whitewashed from from history. But what about all the payments for all these massive songs? Did that continue to roll Jim in? Jim was the most someone? wealthy uh, prisoner in the California Penal Authority because of those royalties. Pr- pretty much just Layla. I mean, yeah, you know, that, that alone. Rock and roll stew by traffic, I doubt, kicks down a lot of dough. Uh, but, um, the, uh, family didn't talk to him. He hadn't seen his daughter since she was 10 years old. Uh, and, and she was very close to her grandmother. This was, she was 14 and she was traumatized by this. Um, his ex-wife wanted nothing to do with him. She was very close to her mother-in-law. Uh, same with Mike Post, his lifelong, uh, 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 associate and best friend. No, no. J- uh, Jim cut himself off from everybody in the world when he did that. There's no blueprint for how to handle that situation. So you don't blame people for not wanting to be around him, but w- how was he received as a, as a prisoner? He well, must, people two, must've uh, liked uh, him. Uh, 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 there were two attitudes about it. One, which was, you know, wow, he was a rock star. And the other was what a waste. So Jim, from what I know from talking to people who uh, served time with Jim, was not super present on the yard. He was kind of reclusive, stayed to himself, uh, didn't play music in any organized fashion, would occasionally sit in with the prison band, but really, you know, avoided that. Uh, And this is in keeping with how schizophrenics behave as they get older, they become more and more withdrawn and more and more reclusive. God, yeah. Well, it's a sad story. It's obviously a very sad story. I mean, the guy, it's not something where you hear about some people and you go, man, that is an evil person. I mean, Jim seems like he was tortured the entire time. And I, I, you feel bad for him, but then you're torn too to be like, well, the guy killed his mom. So that really sort of pulls people in both directions. So Zappa said, that he doesn't condone murder. But if this has to do with chemicals in the brain, it could happen to anyone. Yeah. Jim never really got much help. It's, 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 there's no shortage of irony about Bart, the, the, the rock scene of the 70s, incredibly accommodating, uh, hospitable to drug addicts, alcoholics, sex deviants. But somebody who was actually mentally ill, I don't really know what to do with that. He yeah. never got any of the compassion that he deserved. But on the other hand, all the world knew was that he killed his mother. That just came out of the blue. They don't know about the 15 hospital admissions behind that. They don't know yeah. about the years of torture of all the incredible efforts that Jim went through to try and rid himself of these voices and get back to the golden life that he was scheduled to lead. None Mm. of that made the papers or the Rolling Stone or anything. What came out is just that, wow, this guy had been disappeared off the scene, and then suddenly the voices made him kill his mother. That's very lurid and and, and, and tawdry and, and, and great material for a headline, but it's not the whole story, and it's not the picture of Jim's life. No, it's not in, indeed. And I was going to ask, I mean, this is seven years before I was born that this happened. Was this like headlines all over? Was this major news? You know, this mega rock star just, did they latch onto it? And it wasn't it OJ a- Simpson by any means, but sure. uh, <laughs> you know, the guy that played on uh, Eric Clapton's records kills his mother. He gets his name in the newspaper. 
Yeah, that's fair to say. Yeah. Boy, okay, but he passed away in 2023, um, so very recently. I mean, were you already working on this book in some capacity, or did you start? I mean, how long have you, how long did this take? I've been working on the book for about four years. Uh, It came out of the pandemic. Um, And uh, I had completed the manuscript and submitted to the publishing house, Uh, took a, a, a vacation, went to Hawaii. And the first morning that I was in Hawaii, I got a call from Mike Post. Mike was Jim's high school buddy. They were in their first band together. He was his daughter's godfather. And when I first started to research the book, I got a hold of Mike Post to see if there would be any possibility of getting the family to cooperate with me. And he was very respectful, but absolutely not. No question about it. This was a trauma to these people. They wanted nothing to do with it. And wished me well, but that was it. So Mike's on the phone telling me that Jim has died and the family wants to get out in front of it and they want to send out a release, but they don't know how. And sure, they wondered if I could do it. So no problem. We sent out the press release announcing Jim's death. And at that point, then Mike and Jill, Jim's wife, and daughter Amy became involved in the project. We conducted interviews, shared photographs, um, and now they've read the book and 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 they're extremely moved by it. Mike Post said that it caused him to understand that he couldn't have helped Jim and that he had felt guilty yeah. all this time because he hadn't helped Jim enough. And now he realized that was not possible. The daughter told me that the book explained so much to her that she needed to understand, and they're grateful. And this, the, 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 the word for that part is validation. Totally. And those yes. people read this book, and I was aware they were out there when I was writing it, but I wrote the book that I wanted to write and told the story the way I wanted to tell it, and to have them be able to embrace that work given all they've been through validation. I think you handled it in a very, it's like, it's factual. It's uh positive. You're like, this guy didn't get a fair shake. He was mentally, it was, it was an imbalance in his brain. I mean, it wasn't his fault. You're not going for the salacious kind of like, you know, you don't have some horrible picture on the cover of the book. That's like, you know, pointing to what what happened. I think you handle it very respectfully. It's f- incredible to read, and it's just it, it it's I don't know, man. It makes you feel a lot of weird. You feel bad for him. You can't believe that it happened. You love the rock and roll history. It's just it's fun to read. But I want to ask you a question about, and this is just maybe it's uh, it, it's you see things on TV or about true stories, but you wonder like like what you said about Jim and his apartment taking things off the wall and taking things out to the to the garbage and bringing it back in if he's alone schizophrenic you know voices in his head how do you know these details to put them in the book and then at what level do you kind of fill in with your own because you're an incredible I, I, author. I didn't fill in much at all but i i okay. did uh happen into a pile of research uh that a couple of gals compiled in 1988, so five years after the crime, uh, they got Jim to agree to cooperate with a book. And they had a lot of interviews with Jim in jail. They had access to his diaries, uh, Mm. his medical records. Uh, They didn't really know what they were were dealing with. Like, you know, I said, well, you had his diaries? And Oh, yeah, they were useless. It was just his studio dates. Oh, yeah, that's useless, right? That's uh, that's a book right there. So <laughs> they they were they were not professional journalists, um, and they they never completed the the book and split up mm, back in the early nineties. And I'd met them at that point and and tried to convince them at that point to turn over their research to me. Uh, one of them just wouldn't let go. It was too personal. So like mm. 30 years later, some 
book editor at Harper Collins says, you know what you should do for your next book, Joel? You should do something about rock and roll and crime. I go, oh, <laughs> Jim Gordon. The and story. I, I circled the crime. back and was yeah. able to acquire that research at this point. So, yes, yeah, invaluable access to, uh, you know, Jim's uh, inner thoughts and, and, and his activities and, and, yeah, all that stuff yeah. about um, weeding his back garden. As you said with those two women, where you can have all that information, but to boil it down and make it into something that's readable and that's a story is truly a skill. I mean, you've written a ton of books, so you you know how to do this as a as a a great rock and roll author. But really, that that's the that's what gets it into you know people's hands to actually want to read it. Is is it a good story? Um, well, good or bad, tragic, and I think you did again. You did a great job. Thank you so much, Bart. I really appreciate that. Uh, it the story. I, I just needed to stay out of the way of the story, and yeah. and 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 get it on the page without uh, prejudice. And yeah. that's what I wanted to do. It was a. It, 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 there were points where it was very difficult to thread that needle. And you just you, you you use your most sense your best sensibilities, but yeah. And you, you, you earlier you said it was fun to read. I, I got to tell you, the, the uh, I would have to uh, go revise that book. Uh, and when I got to the second half, my stomach would turn sour. Yeah, and I couldn't work on the book. Oh. You know, the usual working days, 8, 10, 12 hours. I, I, I would have to go upstairs after a couple hours, just feel terrible. It, it's, it's, it's wrenching, wrenching material. And there's so much pain on every page. And yeah. I came to really feel for Jim. I saw into his troubled heart and I came to really feel for this guy. Like I was going to give him the compassion as an author that he's been deserving all this time and never got yeah i i i don't know how you or anyone would feel about it but it almost just seems like that kind of story that would become nowadays like a netflix show or something these kind of crime stories at first i thought it was an impossible story for a, a, a any kind of cinematic treatment because it's just it's, it's got such a horrible denouement uh uh, as I looked over the book and, and, and came to be more familiar with how the story laid out, I began to see it is cinematic. It is incredibly yeah, it is. cinematic. And, and Jim is a very unconventional hero, but he is a hero. He mm. is somebody who went to battle against a severe enemy, mental illness, and he battled really hard. And in the end, he lost. But that is what drama is about. The controversy, the, 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 ad, the adversity of conflict and the question of whether you're going to overcome it or not. You know, in, in literature, he would have overcome it. In real life, he didn't. Yeah. Well, I don't think I asked this before, but you yourself are are not a drummer, I would imagine, correct? correct. Or are you? I am not. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, know but you're, you're drunk. I, you know. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but this this is a story beyond drummers. I mean, there's some episodes I do with a Civil War historian, and we talk about Civil War drums because they know that world. But this is so beyond that that it it got your attention. Uh, we should tell are people an important part of the whole thing. Like I said, I really feel like. Jim's disease was defeated by the drums, that he, his incredible supernatural ability, the drums were a product of his electrochemical setup in his brain. And yeah. then there's the whole spiritual connection of the ancient history of drums. I, I think I said in the book that to strike a drum is to shake hands with the ancestors. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the bass drum is the mother drum and the heartbeat. And, and I mean, I think we're all biased if you're most people listening to this are drummers, but there's something very, um, like you said, it's, it's, it goes, it's ancient there. And I think they're also just a very to, cool instrument. It's physical. Uh, 
mar- uh, keep people dancing, to keep soldiers marching. It's yep. used to hypnotize uh, people. And it, yep. the shaman, the shaman knows the drum as a beacon to guide him home from his out-of-body experiences. Okay? Wow. Hmm. That's pretty cool. I've never heard that one. I've heard uh, plenty of other uses, like firemen hitting drums to let people know and things like that. But wow, that's, uh, it, it. you know, we all love the drums. You're on the Drum History Podcast here, so drums we all love it. But, so let's talk about some of your other books here. I have not read your other books. I've I've heard your name through the research and things, but like you pick the right topics to talk about from what I can see. And I'm excited to read some of your other books, Altamont, uh, Sly and the Family Stone. You have a ton of books. What? So tell us more about your other works. Well, I spent 36 years as the pop music critic at the San Francisco Chronicle. And I, I, I wrote a few books during the time I was at the paper, but in 09, you may have heard about the daily newspaper business. I, I was mm-hmm. one of 120 editorial employees to leave their uh, jobs that year at the Chronicle. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, I've published 12 books since then. So it's about one a year. Uh, the, the, the first thing I did was call my old pal, Sammy Hagar, who had been bugging on me about writing a book and said, do you want to do that book now? And we, we cut a deal in about three minutes. And that thing <laughs> was a number one New York Times bestseller. Uh, Unbelievable. So right out of the box, I felt like there was um, there was some there there. And, and yeah. you mentioned Here Comes the Night. That's the, the biography of a songwriter named Burt Burns that very few people know. And after that book came out, he was inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. A documentary was made about And Rob Reiner has just finished a script based on my book. He's going to shoot the Spinal wow. Tap sequel uh, sometime this year, I think next month. Uh, yeah. And then he's going to shoot the Burt Burns book based on my movie. Unbelievable, man. I mean, that's, again, you're picking cool topics, which, you know, it's obviously looking it's, for stories. It's, uh, yeah, Martin, it's good you know? stories. And, and, and yeah. they're not all always there. You know, people think like, oh, you've done so much, you should write a book about it. You know, no, anecdotes don't make a book. A story makes a book. And you, and, and you find a story then you work on telling it. Altamont was just an obvious story. I don't know why some better writer didn't get to it before I did, but there I was just waiting mm. around for me. And it's a story. Everything happens within six weeks. It's got a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, and uh, the, the Jim Gordon biography is so much more than a biography, right? It's this kind of epic journey through this incredible adversity and this tragic ending. Yeah. I would say the most tra I can't think of a more tragic ending. Maybe for a musician, there's been some pretty tragic ones, but in the drum community, it is the tragic story. I mean, I think that's fair to say. I think, you know, I'm trying to think of other drummers. Gene Krupa being busted in 1943 for, you know, smoking weed. Or having Not Sal Minio as- play him in a movie. That was, oh, my God. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know. There's a full there's a full episode with Brooks Tegler about that movie, um, <laughs> but uh, which was fun. You know, and then I, people we did a show on that that movie and a lot of people came out and said, hey, you know what? That got me started playing the drums. So for people who loved it, I said, you know, whatever. Good for you. That's that's what it's all about. But. All right, Joel, this is awesome, man, but I, I'm going to preemptively ask, because it's going to be a comment on YouTube, where are his drums? Where are his Camco drums? Where are the drums, Camcos? Yes, yes. Which Camco's his, historic brand. And yeah. Two uh, um, sets of Camcos, one of them with the walnut shell. Um, those were his kits. You know, He had yeah. a four-piece kit, and he sometimes put a fifth drum in, sort of like a timbali. It's on its own stand. It wasn't really part of the kit. But um, uh, so they're sold and they've been sold in pieces. Uh, mm. At some point during his incarceration, Jim empowered a former prisoner uh, who had been released to deal with some of his possessions. And that guy put the drums up for sale on eBay. So you can go out there in your drum bulletin boards 
looking and there's a lot of discussion and a lot of photographs yeah. is this jim cam cos and there's snare drums that came from this you know that are for sale that have came from the kit and you know who knows what happened to them right and if wow. those are real pieces of the of, of the true set or not but you, you know uh hmm. th they don't exist yeah. anymore uh, they're out there in the world and then they're not yeah. in the rock and roll hall of fame that's the sad thing that kind of happens if things get split up and uh, and then they never really kind of fully come back together. Dude, There's Jack a John Nietzsche Densmore. Jr. just sold yeah. Hal Blaine's Pearl Kit that he cut all those Spectre records on. Sure. Jeez. And then it's out there and it ends up in who some knows who millionaires. Has it. It's probably yeah. Ursay from Indianapolis, you know, but it's, <laughs> yes. it's, it's just yes. ridiculous that that, that 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 set isn't in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame or some museum somewhere. I mean, yeah, no, it's in a football uh, owning, you know, millionaire billionaires uh, office or something like that. Um, beautiful drums. That's so sad. There, there was, I, I did an episode, which you would probably get a kick out of about a recent uh, a G Gene Krupa. One of his iconic, his drums from the forties uh, ended up in a basement somewhere sitting kind of in a pool of water and, the auctions were kind of spinning around on the forums and, and the owner who's a great guy actually ended up getting them for about 3,500 bucks. So pretty, no, pretty wild. I, I had no detailed knowledge of Krupa's role in creating the modern drum set. Oh yeah. That was fascinating to me. And, and so it's not enough that the guy showed us how to play it. He designed the kit to play it on. Fascinating. Yes. And, and how to act and kind of be a gentleman and be a movie star. And he's got, cause you know, people compare him to buddy, which who kind of had the attitude, but Gene was always kind of the, the dapper, the dapper dude who everyone, everyone looks up to and liked. But um, anyway, but Gene that's Krupa another story protege that never gets the credit that he deserves is Gary Chester. Ah, uh, yeah. You know I know Gary, the name, Gary Chester? Chester. I know the name. I'm sure I've seen Every videos. Every Bacharach or... record, Every Lieber and Stoller record, most of the Burt Burns records, hmm. uh, just all through New York from like 1960 to 1969, Gary Chester was on those sessions. Interesting. Yep. The, the, the cool thing is, is I've done this show. I never, I went into this show five years ago. I mean, I've played the drums my whole life, but I went into this to learn more with people like yourself. And I'm still five. I'm five years in. I'm 230 episodes deep, and I love Gene Krupa, and I love to keep learning things like that. It's there's still so much more to learn. Do a little research uh, on Gary Chester. You'll be amazed. Uh, I will. It, it, yes. Some of his famous uh, uh, tricks was he had a, a tambourine on his hi hat. Oh yeah, and which later Bonham used in, oh, in no, some that capacity. Oh no, the Gary Chester the, thing. The, tambourine on the, the hi hat. Ring. Yep. As, as, as T Bone Burnett says. I don't like hi hats. I don't want that rigid di distinction of time on my records. <laughs> uh, and the other That's thing funny. was, uh, he used to put, you know, remember sand ashtrays? Mm -hmm. Ashtrays with little bags of sand underneath them? Yeah, I he think used to so. Throw yeah. that on his snare drum. Oh, wow. Which everybody now else uses wallets, of little, right? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Now that's a whole industry of little tiny things to put on your snare. But uh, all right, Joel. Well, I appreciate you, you coming on here and sharing your story, man. Everyone can check out Joel's website, Joel Selvin, S E L V I N dot com. Uh, smartass, the music journalism of Joel Selvin is the headline. <laughs> I think you're a nice guy. I don't think you're a smartass to me, at least, which I, which I appreciate. <laughs> well, we're talking about Jim. <laughs> Why don't you tell people where they can uh, get the book now you that it's buy out book. again? You should, if, if you're interested in buying the book, you should definitely buy it at your local independent bookseller. It is, of course, yes. available at all online booksellers, such as Barnes & Nobles and the other guys. But, uh, you know, help your bookstore. Yep, I hear you loud and clear. Yep, support the small ones. All right, Joel. Well, thank you very much, my friend. It's been a pleasure. Um, I want to also thank Ben Merlis uh, for helping and coordinating us. Uh, we, he and I have talked a lot, and he's listened to the show before. Yeah, and, he's, uh, has he's heard a fan. it before. Yes, so I appreciate that to Ben. So, Joel, thank you for being here. Uh, my pleasure, and uh, good luck with the with the progeny. <laughs>